so uh, welcome everybody to this um, uh, final session for the uh, current academic term before Christmas uh, of the uh, Center for World Christianity here at SOAS. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to welcome the very reverend um, uh, Dr. Em Evangelos Tiani, um, who is um, a, a priest of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Alexandria and all Africa, so that's the African Orthodox Church, um, uh, serving for the Orthodox Church of Kenya, um, and uh, placed in Nairobi, I believe. Um, so it's uh, a uh, not just a pleasure to introduce him as a um, somebody who knows the uh, Orthodox Church and doctrine inside out, but also because he has uh, much experience in um, the teaching of uh, uh, theology, both practical and public, as well as uh, development studies. So this is a, um, a, a almost a practical application of Christianity. And uh, certainly other offices too. So I, I, he will, we can talk about your various, uh, uh, your various services, public services and services to the church uh, later perhaps, uh, but um, you are uh, also very well known in the world because <coughs> you have so many offices and this is, uh, um, you know, Orthodox colleges and uh, you're uh, in Kenya, you're, you are known also internationally. And today um, you'll be talking about the links between the Orthodox Church and the Mao Mao liberation movement. Um, this is a topic which I studied in history. I've never looked at it from the vantage point of a, um, a, a, an event where the church would have been vital. But um, so on the contrary, it's known in uh, the, the, it's mostly the Protestant uh, missionary um, circles as, as an evil event and um, and this is uh, uh, certainly something where we can uh, get a, um, a the historical perspective right so i don't want to say so much more other than uh, we uh, i that i look forward to the uh, coming uh, introduction and uh, discussion afterwards uh, by uh, uh, dr Evan evangelos tiani so i'll pass over the word to you and if you have anything to share, then I can I can share the screen with you. I, I don't know. Um, one second. I can make you co-host. Um, there we are. And you should have a little green button coming up at the bottom. Thank you very, very much uh, for this uh, very mm -hmm. great privilege uh, of being uh, a discussant and uh, a presenter uh, this afternoon uh, for this uh, uh, renowned uh, program, uh, as well as the presentations that have happened before. I know that uh, I am the last one and hopefully uh, I won't uh, uh, kill everybody with boredom, uh, with uh, <laughs> with a lot of discussions, especially that uh, now that Christmas is coming. But uh, allow me to first uh, thank you, Dr. Lars uh, Lehman, uh, for for giving me this privilege to be part of the present, uh, to be the main presenter today, and uh, also many thanks to to a great friend and uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Romina Istrati, who is uh, been a great friend and a very close one, uh, and also a collaborator in the different activities of um, that concerns our continent, as well as uh, uh, faith. Um, I, I, today, I, I want to bring uh, <clears throat> uh, one, uh, one item that is uh, of very great importance uh, to, to us all, uh, here in Kenya, uh, the Mau Mau Liberation Movement and how it affected uh, uh, the church that I belong to, that's the Orthodox Church in Kenya, uh, from my, uh, my research. Now, why, this, uh, why, why is this important to me uh, as a researcher? Uh, from, uh, from the time of independence, uh, when the British government and the government of Kenya um, you know, uh, the British government kind of uh, gave uh, 
you know, Kenya go ahead to initiate a free country called Kenya. And then the government of Kenya took over. But since then, uh, they, these two governments have tried to distort history or erase the memory of the Mau Mau liberation movement. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, George Santayana says, that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, this is what is happening very often in our country, in that, uh, especially during the elections, when we have, um, uh, you know, two parties uh, pulling, each pulling uh, from their end, uh, sometimes we see post-election violence. And I, I believe it's because we have a very selective memory when it comes to the Mau Mau. Now, it is therefore wrong to not remember where one has come from, for such could save their future. And I believe for Kenya, this is the, the, the truth, that because we don't know most of the time, the younger generation do not know where this country came from, how people suffered, how people uh, had to go through a lot of challenges to, to realize the freedom that we have today. Sometimes they, 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 they do not know what they are doing when they are tormenting each other, when they are fighting each other. Now, while collective memory matters, memory is very individual. Therefore, what I'm going to bring uh, forward to you uh, is, a, is, a, is a new version or a version that the Orthodox Church in Kenya believes to be their, their memory, even when it is about the same issue of Mauma, where many people have written. Uh, I, I bring to you today what the Orthodox uh, believe Nevertheless, uh, these individuals are influenced by groups. Uh, for example, the group that influences uh, my thinking is that of the Orthodox, coming from um, an Orthodox family, having been a, a third generation Orthodox, and my grandparents being in the Mau Mau uh, war. Therefore, for me, I am already a participant uh, in this, uh, already this research, but also a, a researcher. That notwithstanding, the identity that memory offers a group or society also helps bring back their dignity and justice. For memory is not just about the past, but also the present. So when we bring back these events of history about the Mau Mau and what it has to do with our church, it's also bringing out our dignity and our justice as the Orthodox Church, as you will see later on. Uh, because it is oppressive to not tell the history of a, of a group. I, and actually it's infringing on our rights when our history is not told because most often it is not told uh, uh, with this version that I'm going to tell you today. The, especially now the role of the Orthodox Church in forming the nation of Kenya uh, and like that of the Mau Mau has been eliminated with time in Kenyan history. If you look at the textbooks that uh, were teaching history in the past when I was in school, the Orthodox Church, the Mau Mau warriors, uh, the Mau Mau um, militants were very important in that Kenyan history. Today, the government have uh, seriously eliminated uh, this uh, form of uh, history and they created now a new form of history. Uh, furthermore, while well, colonialism, freedom uh, or liberties, politics, economics, peace, war and conflict, human rights, governance, labor and education have to some extent been discussed in relation to Mau Mau, a religion or, or theology or the church have not necessarily been pointed out as, a, as an important participant in this discussion of the Mau Mau. Now, this research is a descriptive, interpretive, qualitative study, and it is seeking to elucidate the place of the Orthodox Church in the 20th century liberation initiatives in Africa, as well as expound on the effects of the liberation of the nation Kenya to this Orthodox Church. Now, um, I collected data using uh, one, the literature uh, and the historical texts that exist on the Mau Mau, analyzed that, and then uh, did some interviews of uh, 15 participants who are interviewed uh, to bring the empirical knowledge of the present and to corroborate the past uh, because the Orthodox have not uh, been uh, put in most of these um, past texts. Some texts have uh, the Orthodox Church in the picture, some do not have. But I needed to, to bring uh, the conversation of people and what they think today and the, the place of the Orthodox Church in all of this, as well as uh, all of these people who are mainly first and second generation uh, uh, people who are born as Orthodox uh, or from Orthodox families who are over 60 years. Uh, and then uh, I also had uh, an overt observation 
because the participants were always aware of what I was doing. And uh, like I said earlier, I'm an observer a participant, considering I'm a member of this uh, same church. Now, what is this uh, Mau Mau Liberation Movement? Now, before I come to that, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, uh, originally, before the missionaries and the colonial masters came, uh, Kenya had only uh, tribal kingpins and, uh, you know, every tribe had its own leadership model, uh, but the, almost every Kenyan nation was very welcoming to foreigners. Uh, the land was mainly owned communally, so people are not really worried about somebody coming, setting up their house, uh, starting their own uh, thing here and there, as far as they ask for permission. And, uh, and the, the, the system of governance uh, among uh, most African societies, uh, the way people govern, their religious way of life, their economics, their riba, their way of educating their people, their culture, their normal way of life was one and the same. There was no distinction that that is governance, that is religion, that is economics. Everything was mixed. Uh, but when the British came and Christianity came, that is after the scramble uh, uh, for Africa in Barin, in 1885, uh, the explorers uh, were the first ones who came uh, and the uh, Christians, uh, missionaries, sometimes the Christian missionaries were also explorers and they started in the coastlines and then they came to the mainlands because Kenya had very good weather, excellent farming lands and good transportation. Um, it was very good uh, for all these people who came to, to Kenya and there was very good relationship between the, the British uh, Christians, explorers, and the missionaries at the very beginning. But then when imperialism became a thing, that is when Kenya became a protectorate uh, in 1885, the European civilization became a very big thing for those people who are from Britain who are living in Kenya. And they started demonizing the African way of life, the African religiosity, the African way of doing economics, uh, the African way of educating their children, their culture, and everything was to go off out the window, the baby and the baby water. So uh, the Africans became squatters. Uh, la their lands were taken, their property were owned uh, by the imperial uh, government and, the, and then labor laws uh, started coming up that were very uh, oppressive. There was uh, a lot of tax payment now to the imperial government. Uh, then uh, the society started uh, having social divisions, which we didn't have before. Uh, so there were people who were Indians, there were uh, whites, were the, the, the whites were, were the first class, second class were Indians. If you are a little bit light skin, you are kind of a third class. If you are very dark, you are kind of the fourth class. And then racism kicked in. These were some uh, things were, that were very foreign to the Africans. Although they belonged to different uh, tribes, they used to, to coexist together. New governance sy systems, religion, of course, changed. Uh, Christianity was the main religion. The way of doing economics changed because there was money now involved. It was not butter trade anymore. So a lot of things in a way changed. But what was even more hurtful was the slavery that was happening. Some people are sold out as slaves. A lot of people are sexually assaulted, others murdered. There was a lot of violence uh, when you're working uh, for white people and things started changing. So it became, it started very well, but the journey became something else. So then the Africans went to the second world war. Uh, and uh, from there, they learned how to fight, how to have militant groups. And then when they went in the war of, in Burma, where the independence of India was being sought for in the 1940s. Again, they learned that you can fight the colonial masters. And this became a big thing. So these Kenyan soldiers, when they came back, they started forming military groups because now they had military expertise from the uh, Europeans. And then they learned of the guerrilla tactics uh, from their opponents in India. And therefore they started the Mau Mau Liberation Movement. The Mau Mau Liberation Movement was to, uh, to not, it was not the only thing that was going on because we had already religious uh, rebellion. We had educational rebellion. We had trade rebellion um, and we had political rebellion. The only thing is we didn't have a military 
group on the side of the Africans. And that is how the Mau Mau was formed. It was formed out of two terms. It's actually one word, but if you say it in Kikuyu, it is Uma Uma. It means get out, get out, and do it hurriedly. And so the idea of the Mau Mau was to push out the British out of Kenya as soon as they would manage to do that. So they retreated to the forest, they started attacking at night. They made sure they left very gruesome murders that would terrify the British and their loyalists. Eventually killing over 2,000 2, British and uh, some Kenyan uh, royal supporters uh, uh, with them. It was fighting the British from several angles that helped bring an end to the colonialism and imperialism in Kenya. This 12th of December, uh, we, we, we are now 58 years since uh, this, uh, we got independence. So why the Mau Mau insurgents? There were many reasons. One, the natives were considered only good for labor. So a lot of the education they got in school was about labor. They were not taught how to, to read for their own purposes. They were taught how to read so that they can do better work. The settlers took all the good lands and uh, these lands belonged to the Africans. They wanted them back. They wanted also to farm. They were forced to pay taxes, but only these, uh, these taxes only benefited the white settlers. So the issue was not paying taxes. The issue was it benefited the white settlers. There was creation of divisive social classes, like I mentioned, a lot of oppressive laws that uh, were good for the whites and not good for the locals. There was a lot of extrajudicial killings, a lot of murder, a lot of rape, torture, starvation, detention uh, in the camps, among other inhumane acts. Desire for freedom and human rights was what uh, created these insurgents. And uh, for the fact that some African countries now are becoming independent, and uh, there was this Africanization fever of having Africans as leaders. The need for local leadership that Africans uh, can lead and they can take control. Also, this was another thing that uh, pushed them. The power to make legal decisions nationally because the Africans had no legal uh, power in anything. Uh, and then also they had already incapable military power and national leaders and uh, desire for localized development. All of these, among others, were the reason that the Mao Mai insurgents um, uh, started. So the Mau Mau revolt and war helped show how torn Kenya was, forcing local villagers to decide to physically fight trained soldiers with modern uh, weapons. It was the force of the Mau Mau uh, that exerted on colonial regime that made the British listen to the Kenyan elites, seeking for freedom and uh, seeking for labor rights and political rights in both Nairobi and London, uh, where some of them were sent uh, to do so. And uh, this is why the Mau Mau were very important in helping uh, push the other agendas of liberating Kenya. Now, right before the Mau Mau was started, the Orthodox Church was formed. It was formed in 1929 after a female genital mutilation issue that was circulating between the, 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 the Scottish missionaries and, uh, and, the, and uh, some of the, the English missionaries that were uh, in, in central Kenya had an issue with. Yeah, they, they had an issue with the FGM. They wanted to shut it down, but the Africans were like, you have shut down so many of our cultures. You have taken a lot of uh, other things. And uh, this kind of broke the camels back. It was not the main issue, but it became the main issue because that's how the Africans started having a voice that we have to keep up with our rituals. We have to keep up with our circumcision rituals, even if it's for girls. Yeah, because you are just saying this. They didn't see it as a bad thing. They saw it as a, you're telling us this because you have a problem with everything about our culture. So, so this became a very big issue. And some people were kicked out of the church, of the, of the, of the Presbyterian and the Anglican churches, uh, missionary churches in Kenya. And at that juncture, they formed their own church, but also their own schools. So the African Orthodox Church of Kenya was formed as a reaction now to the imperial rule and the institutions away from imperialism. Because now you can form churches before you could not form your own church. Now you can have your own schools before you are not allowed to have your own school. And that became a, 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 a way to show that the Africans can hold institutions and be leaders in them. 
So they initiated local faith and schools away from censored institutions because the missionary schools were teaching um, mainly against the Africans and the African religiosity, the African cultures. And now all of this was not censored. They were also teaching that uh, the imperial government was a good government. Now the Africans had a, 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 um, a chance to teach the opposite, to teach liberation. The church that would respect the locals as humans with their cultures and philosophies was formed out of the Orthodox Church. The religious institution that would pray for and accommodate the national politics and freedom struggles. Now the, the freedom fighters have their own church. They have their own schools. An African uh, ally uh, to, 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 to fight uh, the battles that the Africans would not uh, do because the, the British government respected churches, they respected schools. Now they could listen. Those, those people who are leading the church, who are leading the schools can be able uh, to, 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 to speak on behalf of the Africans. And that is how the Orthodox Church was formed. But how was it related to the Mau Mau? It was formed at the, the same liberative principles of Mau Mau, only that it came before the Mau Mau officially recognized the uh, movement. And uh, all the adherents of the African Orthodox Church joined or helped the Mau Mau fighters in their, um, in their, in their journeys, in their their day-to-day -day life, in fulfilling their issues. How did the Orthodox help? They provided the, um, the most combatant. Most of the Mau Mau uh, fighters belonged actually to the Orthodox Church. Those at homes were the spies, uh, those levels, because a lot of them, the combatant went to the, to the forest, but those, were, those people who were left at home were the spies that did the reconnaissance before and during raids of the Mau Mau. Um, and then they gave a recognized religion to the Mau Mau. They educated the Mau Mau families. They created a space to breed and recruit more adherents and fighters because within the schools and within the Orthodox churches, uh, that's how Mau Mau got their members. The members, especially women, are the ones that transported food, weapons, medicine and messages for the Mau Mau without being detected by the British uh, soldiers. Also, it was proof that the Africans uh, having an Orthodox church, having the Orthodox schools, these were proof that the Africans could initiate, govern and lead institutions on their own without the British. And this give, gave morale to those people who wanted to take um, leadership positions. And they also spoke for the afflicted and those massacred because within the church, in the pulpit, you can say whatever you want. When you come out, you have issues, but you can say whatever you want in the pulpit, nobody will stop you. And at the same time, this church gave refuge to the suffering and they grieved, which were so many at that time. Now, how did uh, doing all of this for the Mau Mau affect the Orthodox Church in Kenya? Now, on the positive side, the Orthodox Church was the first to start private schools in Kenya, which admitted everyone, no matter their religious affiliation, and educated them not just for uh, labor reasons. For the first time, we had private schools in Kenya, and for the first time, the students were not screened from what religious affiliation or from what families they come from and what they agree with about culture, what they don't disagree with, which was happening with all the missionary schools. If you didn't agree with the missionary uh, statements, then you would not be allowed again. Uh, like I said, all the, the missionary schools then were about creating labor, uh, a, a labor force out of the African. But now they have schools that can educate them to be bright people, to be people who know issues, not for, for, uh, for labor reasons, but uh, for education purposes. And at the Kikuyu Karenga Education Authority and uh, the African Orthodox Church in Western Kiambu, Nairobi, Rift Valley, uh, we had many schools uh, from uh, the Karinga um, section. And then the Kikui Independent School Association took over uh, today by the African Independent Pentecostal Church, which cut itself away from the Orthodox in the 1940s. But then uh, the, uh, these, uh, their schools covered Muranga, Nyeri, and Eastern Kiambu. These schools were mainly built with local materials and school fees collected from the students. But sometimes there was some uh, money from the government the colonial government through the local native council uh, because of the, um, of the fact that uh, the government had a responsibility to educate people. The Orthodox Church schools also became a breeding ground for the liberation movement 
So that, that was also a positive effect uh, in regards to the liberation in Kenya. They developed senior leaders of the nation, like its school principals. For example, Peter Bio Koinange, one of the first politicians, uh, 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 renowned politician in Kenya, and the very first president of Kenya was uh, a principal in one of the Orthodox schools uh, here in Kiambu, in the outskirts of Nairobi. The Orthodox Church also kept education as a cornerstone of their social services to, to society to this very day, because these uh, schools and this way of doing education uh, from that time is what the Orthodox still do today. They offer a lot of subsidized education uh, to students to come and study, and also awards a lot of scholarships uh, to Kenyans, whether they are Orthodox or not, to go study, uh, to study locally or abroad. And this came from this time of the Mau Mau. Again, the Africanization of leaders and self-sustenance had a major role in the Orthodox church formation uh, or in, the, in the past. Why? Because initially this independence did not disconnect partnership of foreign clergy and aid. For example, the schools were created and built with local money, uh, local material uh, given by parents and uh, student and out of the student school fees. But still, the Orthodox Church would get money from the local government. And when the Orthodox Church then today uh, started their first schools, they would also get uh, money from abroad. Uh, again, the place of the church in liberation was realized through the Orthodox Church. Uh, in the, uh, from that time in Kenya, the religious leaders uh, play a very vital role in Kenyan politics, more so when there are disputes. For example, now, everybody who wants to be, to be in the presidential and uh, you know, a political race next year, they are visiting a lot of churches in Kenya because Africans are very religious, you know, they, they attend churches. So the religious leaders have had a very, very important uh, role to play in Kenyan politics from that time of the Orthodox Church during the Mau Mau. Another thing is learning to cope with oppressive regimes. Kenya since that time have had uh, now through religious leaders guiding people, calming them, uh, demonstrating to them that there is no need to, to fight. Um, you know, oppressive regimes. Uh, we have had uh, a very oppressive regime in Kenya uh, after the first president of Kenya died, the one who took over for 23 years, he did a very, very bad job. But it is the religious leaders that uh, calmed the nations. And when it was uh, time to transit uh, to a new system and new regime, uh, that went well only because of uh, the religious leaders' involvement. With the imprisonment of the first uh, bishop of the Orthodox Church, for eight years, Bishop uh, George Gaduna, religious leaders have been shown that they can also fight for the liberation of their societies, no matter the consequences. In Kenya, the religious leaders are not uh, shy. They do not shy to point out what is wrong because from those days of, of the Orthodox Church being part of the Mau Mau, they, they saw what happened. Although very, the, the only religion uh, that was speaking was, was the Christian, that is the Orthodox in those days, today, the Kenyans have learned how to be bolder in doing this. The Orthodox Church also learned how to borrow substitute clergymen because when their, their leaders were imprisoned during the Mau Mau, they got uh, leaders uh, from a neighboring country of Uganda who helped initiate the Orthodox Church in Western Kenya in the, in the, in the Nyanza region and Nandi regions. That is mainly the Western part of, uh, of Kenya and as well as the Northern part of Kenya. The Orthodox clergymen were also highly involved in the politics of, uh, of uh, Nairobi after independence because at least four of the, of the priests then, Bishop uh, George, Father Moirori, Father John, they were in the local government. They were elected uh, leaders in the local government of Nairobi. So the first uh, local government, the, the very first uh, local government of, uh, of, uh, of Nairobi uh, County uh, had uh, very strong Orthodox uh, you know, leaders uh, in it. And then Dr. Modiora, who was a member also of the same area, uh, became a member of parliament. Today, many Orthodox clergy and their relatives are highly involved in the local politics. A lot of them also holding positions in politics and governance because of these um, uh, initiatives that happen in the Mau Mau. When we go to the negative side, uh, the Orthodox Church senior most president, Bishop George, who was in prison for eight years. <clears throat> Uh, when he was in prison, uh, a lot of uh, issues, uh, a lot of problems arose during that time. Of course, his family suffered and uh, that brought a lot of challenges. Also, we didn't have other clergymen 
And he was the only clergyman in prison during the liberation of Kenya, together with the famous Kapenguria Six. Uh, these are the, the ones who were released later on and they were given, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they, and then we were given independence. And one of them was the first president of Kenya. Although he was part of them, he's never mentioned actually um, uh, when people write history. Also the Orthodox Church lost their schools and lands after they were declared illegal and shut down in November, 1952 in January 1953, during the emergency declaration, to this very day, we have not received those schools. We lost hundreds of schools that we had started uh, before the, uh, the, the independence of Kenya, uh, and we lost them during the Mau Mau liberation. Therefore, for the Orthodox, the colonial ban in a way still exists, uh, because uh, the government then and now have not returned our properties. The Orthodox Church is also highly made up of poor families, having lost their wealth, their estates, other properties to the imperial government, and their and their and their supporters, and their supporters. Um, most of the Mau Mau veterans also got nothing out of the war. Uh, the Orthodox schools were not considered as having good education. Therefore, if you studied in an Orthodox school, you would not transition to a college or university, and you would not get a good job. So this also made a lot of uh, the Orthodox families suffer uh, in a big way. Due to poverty, the Orthodox Church today in Kenya is highly dependent on foreign aid. Although the Orthodox, Orthodox Church was started with very independent minds, uh, like uh, the 17th century saying, he who pay, pays the piper calls the tune. Today, we are highly dependent on foreign aid, mainly from Greece, from Cyprus, um, you know, from the US, from Australia, and uh, and therefore we don't make a lot of our decisions uh, because now we have to follow a lot of the decisions that are uh, made elsewhere because we are dependent on these people only because a lot of our families are extremely poor to this very day. Most Orthodox families are not highly educated uh, because of the fact that uh, our schools were not offering good education in those days. And therefore, it's only the third and fourth generations that are only now getting university degrees. And they, there is a lot of hope for the future uh, and they, maybe the future wealth. Uh, but at the moment, that's when people are getting their degrees. So it's going to take a lot of time uh, for them to, to, to get uh, uh, you know, uh, their space. And the families were also separated due to the war, to death and detention. And most of them were never reunited. Others were separated due to taking, uh, because a lot of the Mau Mau, um, you know, families, especially their, their uh, families that had loyalists on their side, um, those families were separated uh, for, for good. Some of them have reconciled now. We don't have those uh, enmities at the moment, but a lot of them were, were divided then. The Mau Mau royalists and freedom fighters, wives and daughters were raped and taken and married off by force to the imperial guards and chiefs. And uh, a lot of people lost their wives and their daughters. Some people don't know where their, their wives and daughters went to. And, um, and some wives and uh, daughters also don't know where their parents or, or their, their, their husbands are. And some don't even want to go back because of the shame uh, of what happened. And here we are. Many Orthodox adherents were maimed uh, by the bombs and gunshots and torture that happened in those days. And to this day, they still carry those cars. Uh, the silence or silent by experience or the rule uh, is another thing that is a major issue as I started because the Orthodox have stayed off public Kenyan politics. First due to the silencing of all in Kenya, but also because of their bad experience of losing people and property when against the government. Today, the Orthodox church is not very upright. Yeah, you know, uh, if something happens in this nation, people will not uh, go out and say, you know, um, uh, the, this is the orthodox statement on that issue. Well, the Anglicans, the Roman Catholics maybe would uh, give out a statement. The orthodox, even when the issue has happened in our area, most of the time we do not speak because of our very bad experiences uh, in the past. So we, we, we prefer silence. At the same time, our leadership is majorly Greek or from foreign lands. And therefore, most of the issues are not um, taken care uh, of, as we would expect. So it was only after joining the National Council of Churches in Kenya in 2015 that the Orthodox Church in a way got its political voice back 
because since then, uh, the Orthodox Church has seen in press conferences uh, discussing issues that pertains uh, the nation today. Uh, the impact of Mau Mau to the nation was great, but um, the fact that the British uh, are said to have dropped over 50 million bombs in Kenya, maybe they are not small, um, you know, big ones, but small, small ones, but uh, these, uh, for many uh, of the people that are interviewed, was something that scared them to this very, very day. And they feel that they were so much hated uh, to, being, uh, to, to having bombs being brought into their nation. And the massive detention camps were made to screen the locals, pr producing uh, death through sanitary related diseases, a lot of hunger, a lot of forced starvation. A lot of people died uh, because they were executed, a lot of mutilations, a lot of torture, electric shocks, uh, frogging, a lot of sexual assault uh, to women uh, by, by the British uh, soldiers then, and they are loyalists who are also said they were, they were black white people because they were doing the same things that the black, uh, the, the white um, uh, soldiers were also doing. Uh, they formed a lot of psychological and physical harm that could only be considered crimes against humanity. And unfortunately, most of these people who went through this belong to the Orthodox Church. A lot of deaths happened. For example, the parish that I'm serving right now, that village ha has a very big graveyard. Uh, now it's, uh, people are building over it and now people don't really care. Um, but uh, they killed, in 1954, they buried 3,000 people there. All of them Africans. Civil liberties were limited, pushing the desire for human rights and democracy in Kenya to this very day. That's a very positive impact. But in those days, those atrocities uh, and crimes against humanity, as would be considered today, are things that impacted very negatively on the nation. In conclusion, what would I say? Freedom Days memorials are part of what Emil uh, Duquesne calls commemorative symbols and rituals that crystallizes the past and solidifies the unity of a people. Now, there has been a deliberate attempt to erase the memory of the Mau Mau liberation, and with it, any personalities, institutional and educational materials related to this movement are eliminated. Now, while this is happening, while some have questioned Mau Mau's importance to the winning of independence, Others have called for historical amnesia in the interest of national consensus because some people are not involved in this war, considering that most people who took a position in this, uh, you know, Mau Mau are from uh, the central region and major Kikuyus in Kenya. Therefore, some people don't want Mau Mau to be, to be something of importance and to be taught in schools. Others say it's actually not important because it's not the Mau Mau who are there. Uh, in the war, it is the politicians who went to London and uh, who spoke in parliament that won us the independence. The Kenyans who experienced the Mau Mau revolt and their families insist they will never forget. Unfortunately, their stories are not told and are many and written, so they die with them, unfortunately. Writers have also noted that uh, whether these are good arguments about uh, teaching about the Mau Mau or not, they, the issue is are they, is it enough to run the slicing of history, the hiding of history, their historical amnesia of the birth of a liberated Kenya? That remains an answer to this very moment. The Orthodox Church continues to be unrecognized by the government of Kenya. Even historical books keep erasing it. For the Orthodox Independence Day in Kenya resurfaces all the memories of difficulties and losses as well as successes received during the Mau Mau liberation. Unfortunately, even worse, the pain is worsened by the fact that the Orthodox have no space to even say a prayer during the national celebration of the independence of Kenya, a spot it had in the first presidency, now taken by the Anglicans and the Roman Catholics, mainly because they are the ones who are given those spots in Kenya, who are never on the Kenyan side during the liberation movement. They were not part of the liberation movement, but now they are the ones who always say prayers. And every time most of the people I interviewed see them doing the prayer, they, some of them say they cry. Some of them are very angry by the fact that the people who supported the, uh, the British colonial masters are the ones who are in charge of the, of, the, of the independent celebrations of the nation and not the people who fought for the independence itself. Even when war has remained to be one of the most written and compelling subjects in the study of memory, 
the history of the anti-colonial rebellion was Raji's silence in national debates in Kenya after the independence of Kenya, and this defect continues to this very day. The Orthodox Church is among those who internally cling to the memory of the liberation movement, for it is part of their story, and such have always been sidelines, discouraged and unwelcome in the state's institution of post-colonial Kenya. And I think that's where I will end uh, my presentation. I hope uh, that I have made uh, my, 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 my point in, uh, in telling uh, the story of the Orthodox Church in Kenya and why we feel that uh, the liberation movement has forgotten us and uh, how our church has been affected uh, by all these experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thiani. This was a um, tour de force. It was uh, a uh, not just a history lesson. It was also something that tells us a lot about the um, the relationship between the colonial uh, masters and the uh, population. Um, I I have questions, but I would like to pass the word first to our audience. And I can see a hand by uh, Romina Estrati, who's got uh, a question to you. Thank you so much, Lars. Uh, thank you so much, Father Thiani. It was lovely, lovely to be in this presentation. Obviously, I've had the privilege to, uh, you know, uh, have have to host your your paper previously in a, in an edited volume. So thank you so much. I was really interesting to know more about the the actual period of the revolution and the Mao Mao uh, movement. And I'm wondering some of the, the many of the references you you included in this presentation seem to be by foreign of authors, not all. And I'm just wondering how many efforts have been made locally by local native uh, authors and writers to write this history, because I think if I if I read this correctly, there is this ethnic antagonism, I think, of, you know, who was at the forefront of the revolution. And we've seen, some, we've seen something similar with the Tigrayan, with the role of the TPLF party in Ethiopia during the, you know, the colonial era, uh, you know, to, to, to um, preserve, you know, the, the freedom of the country. And now this history is now being questioned, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the recent events that the TPLF has presented and demonized and so on. Um, and, and so I'm just wondering, is there an ethnic com competitiveness, I guess, or antagonism that, that you know that 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 is a hindrance uh, to this to to writing this history, I guess. Um, and then and then I guess the question is if if that's always the case, you know, if there's is there even value in trying to write histories? You know what I'm trying to say: if if histories are always debated by these different uh, religious, ethnic, tribal groups, whatever it is, not just in Africa but in other contexts of the world. Um, I come from Eastern Europe; that has has been the case in our region as well. Um, that means that history will, will always be contested, right? And I just wonder, you know, what is the solution to that? What is the response? Uh, how how would a historiographer respond to that? And I'm not in history, so I'm sorry. This this might be very ignorant on, on my part, but I'd love to know more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, I think from uh, from uh, where I stand, uh, a lot of uh, the Mao Mao liberation uh, movement work is being done by a lot of British scholars and a lot of American scholars. Um, a lot of them actually following the agenda of uh, what the British government produces as uh, monographs and documents, uh, you know, and uh, statements. Um, sometimes once in a while there is a discovery of this or the other contradicting document uh, from these uh, libraries and the collections, but most of the time telling the British side of the story. Very few people are writing about the African side of this story. And unfortunately, the Mau Mau uh, liberation movement happened in the central part of Kenya, where the largest tribe, the Kikuyus, are in. So again, because they were subjected into going into war, into fighting, a lot of the, these people who should write that side of the story are people who are not well educated then. Now, when you interview them today, that's when you get their perspective. That's when you get their story. Then again, we are in Africa where people uh, keep their stories in memory. They don't write them. So they tell their children, their children tell their grandchildren, and they don't see the need to write why it's not our culture. Uh, and so a lot of these uh, have uh, a lot of histories, the right uh, 
histories from our perspective as Africans is gone uh, with our forefathers. Uh, my grandparents, for example, were in the Mau Mau War, but I, I, I didn't have a lot of time with them uh, when I was a grown up because they died uh, before I even uh, grew up because out of the uh, atrocities that happened in those days, a lot of people didn't live long, you know? Uh, so, so we didn't write that side of the story. Is there a need for decolonizing this? Is there a need to, to writing this absolutely? There should be because history is uh, always has an angle. For example, today I gave a religious pers perspective of the Mao Mao. I gave an orthodox perspective of the Mao Mao liberation movement. Yes, it is not being written. Yes, it's not been told this way, but that's a story that exists. That's a story that is there. Should we stay away from it? No, I think we should write it because uh, the people will read in future and then decide what they want to hear what they think uh, they, they want to do. I think the, I don't know. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Lehman as a historian, maybe we'll hear his perspective. <laughs> I mean, this is uh, a very uh, uh, intensely debated uh, um, aspect of history, especially the, the decolonization of history. Um, and um, especially here at the School of Oriental and African Studies, you can imagine. Um, oh. but, I, but I am keeping, making my best effort not to say anything. <laughs> we have, uh, we have um, uh, people, until later, um, we have uh, Francis who would like to uh, say something and followed by Simon. Um, well, thank you for the presentation. Um, I must admit that my first response to this uh, is that it is uh, uh, not really very scientific. Um, that was my first response. My second response is, uh, yes, I know where you're coming from. My background is Lithuanian, um, and my parents came from a country which was uh, taken over uh, by the Russians. Um, they were serfs until the 1880s, um, and industrialization came. Um, Treaty of Versailles, all that sort of thing. And my parents finished up in this country. They didn't tell me about the history of Lithuania. They felt it was right to start again, to bury that past. There was no um, appetite uh, to speak about, I mean, for example, Churchill hadn't supported the liberation of Lithuania in any way. Uh, it was lost as a country. So the very word Lithuania wasn't known when I was a kid. I'm 76 and I went to school and we adopted different names to fit in. You know all of this side of it. But um, I think also about the German friends I have, including someone whose father was in the SS and was a slave in Russia. Uh, he himself had joined the SS at 16. Uh, he didn't, you know, he was born out of wedlock. And he didn't get involved in anything particularly nasty, apparently, according to his daughter. Uh, but he was a slave in, Soviet, in the Soviet Union until 1954. Um, cheap labor. I worked with the British Council. I worked in cultural relations. Uh, I, I worked and, and lived in Nigeria. I remember meeting someone in Nigeria who said, yes, we could set up a, for, uh, a company. Uh, we could set up the manufacture of... Uh, motor cars in, in, in Nigeria, uh, so long as we broke down the bits of work that needed to be done by the unskilled, um, inexperienced uh, Nigerians to small enough bits that each part could be quality controlled. And when, when you think, I studied philosophy of education, I notice, I remember the way in which education started in this country, through the, through the Christians. It wasn't a matter of offering education for nothing. It was, I mean, the Christians did, but uh, the, the state um, was concerned about managing the institutions of the state and the institutions which provide the structure within which people can grow. So my, my question is that, to go back to my first response, which is that what you're speaking sounds very much like propaganda. Um, and, and all I can say to bring it to, to a question, is the Orthodox Church, and to look at it with regard to Christianity. I mean, liberation theology, fair enough. I, can, I understand a little bit about liberation theology. Um, in your analysis, there's nothing to do with uh, social movements. Um, you speak about the Orthodox religion, but, and it's very easy to be a 
to be against something. The problem is to be for something. And if you talk about Christianity, you talk about essentially some movement for something. You speak about the spies, you speak about the atrocities of the Mau Mau, you speak about the atrocities of the colonializers. But where's the Christianity in anything you've said? Not at all, to my mind. Female genital mutilation. Well, uh, you didn't tell us uh, what was the uh, orthodox uh, response to that. Were they just jumping on a bandwagon because of the Scottish and Presbyterians being so much against it that it offended local sensibilities? The fact that they were against, uh, that these local sensibilities were not, well, I, I, I've said enough. I mean, I, I want to provoke you a little bit. I want to provoke you a little bit because I, I think you need to be challenged. I think there are too many people who are prepared to say, oh, yes, 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 you have your side of the story. But you've got to speak your side of the story within a context of some discipline. And there is no economic discipline. There's nothing remarked about uh, industrialization. Um, there's nothing spoken of with regard to uh, the, the in which the local, uh, the, the orthodox tradition valued the local tribes and honored them. Were there, you, you touched already on the point of lack of historical documentation uh, before uh, the colonizers came. Well, that's pretty important for any study of history, isn't it? Um, the fact that the fact that we as human beings want some sense of roots and identity doesn't necessarily justify us bigging up uh, the importance of, of, of our place in history. I mean, if you look at Lithuania, I mean, what should I do? Say, say it was the Garden of Eden? As in, you'd, I could go on. I've spoken too long already. Okay, thank you very much, Francis. So uh, th this was um, a, um, what would you say, an antithesis um, um, uh, Evangelos, could I please ask you to come up with the synthesis? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Francis, thank you very much uh, for, for, for coming up with, uh, with that. Uh, is it propaganda? Of course, uh, uh, in every situation, there is always one side that says, this is a story, uh, this is my story, and uh, the other side said, that's propaganda. Maybe I should ask uh, maybe the same question of uh, all these uh, uh, British reports, was that propaganda? Uh, maybe that's what the, we ask as the Orthodox. Uh, was what we called the Orthodox during the Mau Mau era? No, we were not in the beginning. We were called the Karenga movement. But uh, then I had only a few minutes to bring all these uh, issues together. I couldn't put it uh, forth. But it, we became only the Orthodox in 1946. We joined the Greek Orthodox in 1946 officially. That's when we were received officially. So we were not always the Karinga movement. We were a local, local African instituted church uh, before that. But then I had only 40 minutes to bring you and paint all these issues. What I try to do is give the story that is not told mm -hmm. from the other end. Because if I would tell you the story that you already know, then what would be the point of me coming to seek uh, such a discussion? Yeah. Then uh, it wouldn't have been useful. Yeah. So I bring forth, I bring forth the, the, within the 40 minutes that I had, the side uh, that I know that has not been told. Uh, in a paper, it will be written uh, better. Uh, maybe I didn't present it better for you, I'm sorry. But it's not propaganda. It's what the local people uh, I interviewed and the, what uh, is actually actual in historic books also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Simon, I can see your hand. Hello there. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm not just a bit declaring interest, well, partly my interest. I'm, I'm last as one of my, my supervisor, but I'm not on Kenya. <laughs> Is actually my uh, parents used to live in Kenya in the late 50s and early 60s. It was, I think, after the Mau Mau, more or less after the Mau Mau. Mau Mau was still around, but not. They drove through Aberdeer Forest once when they were always pouring with rain. And that's uh, about the closest they ever got to the Mau Mau. The Mau Mau didn't do anything to them. <laughs> well, I'm still here, so you know the Mau Mau didn't do anything to them. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, it's quite interesting because, it, I mean, looking at different perspectives is because um, my parents were expats, not settlers. Now, settlers were a bit different. Yeah. Um, and um, 
My mother was always a bit defensive about uh, Kenya, but and I had to be careful what I said. Um, but um, she um, she did let slip sometimes the stories are, are sort of often petty ways of disrespect black people would be treated uh, by you know uh, often the settlers or or, or people from who come from you know very humble backgrounds in the north of England and came to Kenya and some and suddenly they find they are you know something important. They've got people beneath them, and they would treat people with extreme disrespect. Um, and even people who are quite affluent, they used to, uh, the Asians also were treated uh, uh, treated disrespectfully. Um, is that there was a there was someone who was a very well paid civil servant in Nairobi who used to insist on 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 the uh, Asian shopkeeper weighing eggs, you individually weighing eggs. Such petty sort of petty racist uh, stuff. It used to go on all the time, and it's not really uh, surprising that there was trouble. Um, but um, the one thing is, uh, certainly my mother would uh, uh, stress on me, because uh, is, is it, you may think this is a bit of an old myth, but um, is, is how far, well, actually, but this church, and how far is, was it a Kikuyu-based uh, organisation? How far was Mau Mau Kikuyu? Is, it, is this just a stereotype that it was just Kikuyu against everybody else? Or is it, you know, were there, because the, the British colonialists, um, like they always do, would play different ethnic groups off against each other, and um, and a lot of the victim, uh, victims, uh, of the people who were killed by Mama were not white people. In fact, you very few um, were mostly other 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 black people from different ethnic groups. And I don't know if that's a bit of a stereotype. What 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 you think? And actually, particularly with this church, was it was it a broad church with different ethnic groups, or was it mainly Kikuyu? Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for bringing actually uh, very very insightful um, question into this. It was not just the Kikuyus, but because the Kikuyus were the most in this uh, uh, region, and they they also owned the very productive lands, mm. they were the most aggrieved in this whole situation. We had Merus, we had uh, um, Kirinyagas, we had Embus. And most of the time, they are not mentioned. For example, there were the... the, the, the the warriors that were in the Mount Kenya forests, that area is not mainly Kikuyu. It's only one side of it is Kikuyu, but mainly the Merus mm. and the, 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 the Kerinyagas, the Embus, they are mainly there. But uh, because the Kikuyus were the loudest into all this, and they, they were also the ones who were in London, for example, pushing, uh, there were also Luos in that whole thing, but people don't see the Luos, they don't see the Luyas, they don't see uh, mm. the coastal region people. They only see the Kikuyus because they, there is always this agenda uh, that when you say it's just the Kikuyus, then the rest of the tribes in Kenya will not see the importance of the Mau Mau. They will say we are not part of the liberation movement. Therefore, why would we want that to be our story? Because if it's our story, then it progresses and it uplifts one tribe, the Kikuyus, that is, mm -hmm. which are the majority uh, uh, people in, the, in Kenya. They are the ones in leadership uh, most of the time. And they, 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 they have taken most of the senior positions. So if you, if you speak about this, then you're upgrading them. Therefore, it helps actually silencing, in silencing uh, this, um, this agenda of bringing this history out. But... The Mao Mao was not just about the Kikuyus. Unfortunately, that's what is painted by a lot of historians. Mm. Yes, they suffered the most, but it's not just about them. Mm. And the church was, um, how many, were there many different groups in this church? Yes, the, the, the Orthodox Church, uh, like I, I mentioned already, we had Luos, we had Luyas, we had Kalenjins, mm. we had Nandis, we had Kikuyus, we had Merus, we had Embus. Yes, it was a diverse mm. church. But it was mainly based in uh, Nairobi, the central yeah. region uh, around Mount Kenya region, Western Kenya, Rift Valley. Uh, but it was not in the north and in mm. the in the mm. coastal region. It has only gone to those other areas much later. Yeah. Were there any ethnic groups which were particularly pro-British or or um, uh, indifferent? Oh sure. yes, a lot of Kikuyus were on the British side. How That's why I said when we uh, when the Mau Maus killed people, they also killed their own brothers, their own sisters, their own relatives. Yes, uh, families were broken because one side is with the Mau Mau, one side is with the royalists. Whether they 
they plan to be on that side initially, or because of the atrocities that were done to their brothers and sisters, then they decided to go to to the to the British side. Yeah, they were on both sides. Also, we had a lot of Indians that were with with the Africans and some Indians with the British. So yes, it was mixed everywhere. It was yeah. not just yeah. 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 Okay. And because so from the, 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 if, Hmm? <laughs> because the white the white highlands was the the best land and the, the whites yes that and controlled it yeah, yeah. I'm, simon, the settlers I, and they I were very know. hardcore very uncompromising yes. simon i didn't know that you were a kenyan <laughs> yeah. well, apparently yes according to Joe, not only did my well my, yes. well, actually my my parents were married in tanzania in moshi okay in in the uh, and they were there up until about 55 oh. um i wasn't born i wasn't born there at all oh. uh, um but um I actually did a genetic test recently, and apparently it I, I goes all the way back to Kenya. I think it does for most of us, um, or East Africa. Yeah. You know, so. yeah, that's right. Yeah. The, the, it, we are Africans. That, that, that is very, <laughs> we know this, yes. We know this. Yes. Anyway, so um, uh, I, I was, if I can pose a, a question, just a, a simple one. Actually, how did the church start? You, you, you did mention that uh, uh, it only became the... Uh, Known as the Orthodox Church in 1946, 1946. Six, yes, officially, yes. Um, how did it begin? Because th that's something that I was actually quite intrigued by uh, <laughs> from the very beginning. Uh, the, the church started uh, uh, in that uh, during now this uh, when the Africans started uh, wanting to rebel against the the British uh, colonial masters. They mm -hmm. also they wanted to remain Christian. But they didn't want uh, to be led by white clergymen okay. uh, in church. So they wanted an African. So they tried to bring up the subject. It wasn't uh, coming through. Of course, later on, some came. But at that uh, level, no. Everybody who was there would not be an, an ordained cleric. Uh, you would work for the church, but you wouldn't go to such positions. So they wanted this. Uh, and the fact that now the, the, the colonial masters, especially the Scottish missionaries, who are actually, it's like 10 minutes away from my house, where they, they, they had this station, they, they fought the female genital mutilation. They fought it from a medical perspective, which was a good thing. But unfortunately, because they had uh, restricted the Africans from following any of their other cultures, this culture, stop this culture, stop that culture, stop that culture. That is demonic. That is evil. Uh, that is a sin. That is what? When they did all of this, then the Africans rebelled. And they said, we will not stop. Now you have come too far. You are separating us because the boys and girls were circumcised at the same time. And for the Kikuyus especially, if a girl was no, had not gone through circumcision, then they would not be married. So the African uh, parents were like, where do we take our daughters now? What will happen to our daughters? Will they be outcast in society? Of course, they didn't look at it. Uh, the, the missionaries didn't look at it anthropologically or in, it, in any way. It was just, it's a medical thing. The church will help. So anybody who is a follower of, a, of the church should not do this. Let's stop this. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't stop. Because there are some Africans say they won't, and a few of them agreed to stop it. That's when they were kicked out of the church. Mm -hmm. So they started their own churches, and they started their own schools. And that's how this formation of what became the Karenga movement, the independent uh, schools and churches, became the Orthodox Church eventually. How did we join the Orthodox? We joined the Orthodox because in Uganda, there was a similar group that was fighting uh, the British, uh, you know, religiosity because of the same, same issues. They want to be Christians, but they want uh, leaders uh, that are Africans. And uh, when they joined hands, the, one of them found a magazine uh, when they were cleaning uh, their, their master's house a magazine written the African Orthodox Church. And it belonged to the Negro movement in the US. The African-Americans uh, then had uh, initiated a, a mixture of the Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Methodist Church. It was a, a mixture of these churches. 
and they were part of the reparation movement of the 1920s then, Marcus Garvey and others. So they, they, they had just ordained a South African bishop uh, for this, uh, another similar uh, South African group. And uh, they, are, they wrote to him and he, were, he came to East Africa as he was coming to Uganda because Uganda is uh, land rocked. So they, they had to come through Kenya and that's how the Kenyans found uh, this African Orthodox group. And they became part of this. They, they, they set up a seminary in Uganda and in Kenya for almost two years each. They taught some people. The ones who passed well were made priests. The others were made deacons. And, uh, and from there, then we, we, we call ourselves the African Orthodox. And then in the, in the 1930s, a Greek Orthodox um, family in Kampala, uh, wanted their child to be baptized. They found an Orthodox church. They went there and then they said, no, you are wearing like an Anglican. You are using some Orthodox prayers. You are using some prayers that we don't know. You are not Orthodox. And then they had a debate with the priest. And then he, uh, the priest asked, then what is Orthodox? There was a Greek Orthodox priest in Tanzania, Moshe. So they, he connected them there. And then the Ugandans then told the Kenyans that what you have is not really an Orthodox church per se. So they brought them into the Greek Orthodox eventually, and we were received by the Greek Orthodox in 1946 officially. That's how the, the Karenga movement changed into becoming an Orthodox church. This is very interesting. I mean, this, yeah. this is uh, world Christianity in action. <laughs> exactly. Than, this is, uh, yes, I, I, uh, yes. I actually, um, well, but one, I, I know, uh, as I, I'm not sure whether it's the Karenga, but it's, there was a, a similar, when, when I moved to London, I, I was in the south of London, Brixton, and there, there you have a church, and I'm, I'm yes, pretty yes. Sure, sure that it belonged to this movement. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, that's, um, uh, I'm saying this as an outsider, I, <laughs> but, but it brings back memories, yes. Anyway, so um, um, Romina, would you like to say anything or ask anything? Of, well, I'm I'm just I'm listening in and, and learning, and um, I'm I'm just curious to know, and this is a, another topic of debate, how the relationships are now with the Greek Patriarchate. I'm guessing in Alexandra, is that correct, uh, Father Thiani? Yes. So, indeed. how is is there a, um, an effort to make uh, the Church uh, autocephalous, as you know, we have seen with the Ethiopian Orthodox Tahara Church, so in the Oriental side, the Oriental Orthodox side. So what what is the conversation? Because we know that in the Eastern Orthodox, um, we have the patriarchates, and it's they're all equal, but there is this um, seniority, I guess, that you know amongst patriarchates. So how does that relationship work out now? And I know that the Greek Orthodox are not very good at understanding the importance of indigenizing the churches. I think that's a big. Uh, limitation when it comes to the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, they have a presence in Africa and they have tried to understand the local cultures. I think they've made an effort. I don't know how well that has happened, uh, but I think they haven't been as receptive to these calls for indigen indigenizing the churches, which I think are absolutely essential, uh, you know, and, and, and need to be considered uh, promptly because otherwise it just will, will, will beget more grievances and it will be, you know, uh, unproductive for everyone. The aim of the Orthodox faith, as far as, as we know, is to unite peoples across cultures and across geographies and across contexts, right, uh, in, in a shared faith, in a shared dogmatic. So I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on that? And what is the church, the, the Kenyan Orthodox Church, doing in that perspective? Uh, a very interesting uh, question, because we started uh, as an independent uh, church, a church that wanted Africans to be leaders. But now, for example, in Kenya, we have uh, four dioceses. Uh, three of them are led by white people. White people. Well, only one is African. In fact, we have only had, since 1929, we have only had three Kenyans ordained into positions of being bishops. In the beginning, yes, uh, the Greek Orthodox has the, the tendency of uh, ordaining um, unmarried uh, clergymen into the episcopacy. But later on, uh, even when we have so many uh, Kenyans who are not uh, married, uh, the synod, when they sit, they still select people who sometimes don't even speak English. 
uh, to come uh, to Kenya, or they can't speak English properly. So that's uh, that's a very interesting uh, uh, thing. At the same time, contextualization is absolutely important, important in every church. The reason Christianity has been what it is, is because it took the context of every place it went to. Sometimes um, in a big way, sometimes in a lesser way, but the reason that uh, we are where we are is because of translations, is because of uh, contextualizing things and indigenizing things. Unfortunately, even to this day, uh, the Afri uh, the Kenyans have a very big problem with the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate. They, because the Patriarchate of Alexandria is very ancient, it cannot make us an independent church away from it. Secondly, uh, all our bishops still are coming from Alexandria. So mainly from Greece and Cyprus. Uh, another thing is uh, most of the bishops who come here in Kenya, because the Kenyans have this very, uh, you know, very energetic uh, mode of pushing for for their for their liberties and stuff uh we have a lot of court cases between the clergy and laity and the hierarchs because the hierarchs do not understand the kenyan context uh, most of the time and uh, they want to do one thing and the and the cha and the priest and the, the the lay people want to do another thing so this becomes a, a, a major issue uh, another thing is for example a lot of africans uh, and this is uh, the truth. Um, you know, our, the Orthodox Church uh, has only had about three, four hundred years only of um, unmarried bishops. But today, uh, it is taken as if it is a, a very ancient tradition of uh, having uh, only unmarried bishops. And a lot of Africans are married. Marriage is a cornerstone of how we live. Some of our best clergy uh, who can be bishops are married. And now we have a problem because um, the patriarchate cannot allow this to happen. When the conversation is taken to the synod, the patriarch, for example, is for it. And uh, a lot of the other bishops are not for it. So yeah. it becomes a very big, big problem. So I don't know. It's, uh, we are not doing well at all in this regard. And, and you know, Father Thien, if I may add, just in a conversational manner, uh, we, we were discussing the importance of making faith relevant to the times and the needs of the people. Uh, and, and, you know, the family obviously is, is an important fundamental foundational institution. I think in most African nations I have worked in, but generally Orthodox societies uh, across the world, uh, the family is very important. And in Ethiopia, for instance, one of the critiques of, of, of um, unmarried bishops is that they're not connected to the problems of mar married couples. So they tend to come from the ascetic uh, background. So they might have been monks, nuns, uh, sorry, nuns, uh, monks. I'm, I haven't spoken English for a very long time. Menokosat, uh, as we say in Amharic, is much easier to speak in Amharic. So they might have been uh, monastics. That was the word I was looking for. Um, and then they transitioned to becoming bishops. And so they haven't been, you know, the perception is that they haven't been connected to the marital problems and the issues that that everyday people are facing um and and i know i know very well how strict the the church is about changing practices but i think one of the uh distorted perception is that the the church as an institution has been unchanging in time which is not the case because innovations have been made and can canonical rules have changed and have been introduced in the times of its existence which has happened also in the ethiopian orthodox diet of church so when we speak to clergies um they they're very uh, you know, um, hesitant to make changes, but when so we start with 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 some church history, uh, how the Ethiopian Orthodox had a church changed over time. This is taught by local Ethiopian theologians and scholars and historians, of course, not myself. Um, how those changes in canonical rules emerged and why they emerged in the times that they emerged, and why they might not apply in current times, and why we might need to reconsider them. So I think. I don't know if this might be helpful on your end, but understanding that the, the institution is itself has been fluid and responsive and dynamic to the times. It's been an organism. That's that's the point of the faith in the church, right? Being an organism, a living, living institution, uh, and maybe uh, becoming a bit more um, comfortable with change might help also in, in that aspect. I don't know what your thoughts would be on that. Uh, that that's, uh, that's the truth because we have always had... Uh, things that don't change, that is capital tradition. 
yeah. things that have always changed, the small tea traditions. But unfortunately, some people mix this up and they, they think everything cannot be changed. And, uh, and at the same time, history also shows that things have always been changing. Uh, the other day we had uh, about uh, four years or now three and a half years ago, uh, our patriarchate, for example, reviewed the issue of having deaconesses, mm -hmm. women in the church, and they agreed that we'll have them. Unfortunately, after this decision, because uh, a lot of the... Uh, the bishops are from Greece and Cyprus, they were threatened from their own countries that they cannot have in dioceses that they are, uh, they are running um, women as, uh, as deacons in the churches. So even, uh, even the seven women that had already been ordained into this ministry, they were kind of stopped from serving because these bishops feared uh, uh, you know, being uh, censored in their countries at the same time, they get money from Greece, from Cyprus, uh, for their ministry, for their mission. So they couldn't, um, you know, go on with it. Now it's at a standstill. Although we pass this, it's not going on. Another one, for example, another example. Widowed priests in the Orthodox Church are not allowed to remarry. The Greek Orthodox Patriarchate already passed this as a resolution in the 90s that our clergy can remarry especially if they are young and they want to marry again, they can marry uh, and not stop because if you want to marry, you, you have to stop your priesthood. That's uh, the canonical stand. But our patriarchate passed this in the 90s, but a lot of bishops even now do not agree with this. Why? Because they think is it's like a dogma. They, they take this as, as dogmatic. Well, they are not dogmatic. They are just practical matters, being married, being unmarried, uh, being divorced, being, uh, you know, a single person. All of these are practical matters. Unfortunately, because of these uh, bishops also who, who are very, uh, you know, monastic and austere in their, in their decisions, uh, sometimes we do not see the reality of the incarnated Christ in, in our context. And that, that harms our church in a big, big way. I don't know. I tell people that, uh, for example, I am a champion of gender justice. I'm the chair for gender justice for all the religions in Kenya. And the people, uh, I tell people I'm Orthodox and they start laughing because we are the worst people in dealing with this issue uh, within our church. And here I am, I'm a champion, I'm pushing for it. And I keep telling them I'm Orthodox and I don't think we will change in the next uh, uh, 100 or 200 years, but we have to push for it. The fact that uh, we are censored, the fact that uh, we are pushed, we cannot stop talking about it because that's the truth, that's the reality. Absolutely. Thank you, Father Siani. Thank you so well, much. Thank you. Yeah, we, we now have uh, Jesse Mugambi. I, I don't know whether he can hear us. It's uh -oh. the, uh, maybe we have um, um, a moment when he can say hello to you, but it's, hello, are you <laughs> joining in? Yes. I'm very happy that you have managed to come in. Many others were not as lucky as you. They they wrote to me and they said no. So as the so as Zoom system will not let us in. But um, you managed to get through. That's very nice. Well, thank you for letting me in. Thank you. I really appreciate. It. Yes, and it's a great honor to see you here. And of course, we remember listening to your own uh, contribution where you <clears throat> where you commented on uh, the colonial period as well. Um, Anyway, so we have, um, uh, if uh, I'm uh, having one eye on the uh, on the clock and it's actually the time when we uh, traditionally end, uh, but, but I would like to stay with all of you for the rest of the day. Um, that, that is perhaps not possible. Um, uh, yes, so I, um, I, I, all I can say is that I would like this conversation to continue in various ways. And uh, if you were here at um, the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, then you would have this conversation really going on the whole time um, in, in, with various um, um, sides of the story. And um, uh, actually, one thing that uh, Francis mentioned is the, um, is the, the relative value of uh, written uh, history. And this is, I mean, I'm saying this because I'm here in the... Uh, a department of history and we have um a, 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 this is not a discussion actually it's um a, we we are in the stage where we are uh, trying to integrate other types of history of of course these 
eventually everything is, we should see it not as written or uh, oral history, but actually recorded history, because history becomes a, a, a tradition once we, sorry, a, um, a tool for the science of history, once we uh, make use of what is that that can be passed on. And the oral tradition is, of course, we, we have to, we have to regard it in the same way as we see written sources. We know that written sources change. We have them even in the sacred writings, even the Bible <laughs> is changed. You know, we have the, if we compare the earliest um, uh, versions, written uh, versions of that with later versions, we get differences. Um, and the same is true for the oral traditions. So um, I, I, I would like to continue this conversation uh, as I said, but um, the, the time is unfortunately uh, expiring. And if if there's anything that you would like to say at the very end, um, uh, 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 Dr. Thiani, then th this is now the opportunity for you to uh, perhaps say some final words. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and thank you also for joining us. I know that um, uh, it's a privilege for me to have had you for the questions, uh, for your insights, uh, even for, for Professor Mogambi, who was not able to, to ask anything. I know uh, we are always with him. We are very close and good friends. So I'm sure uh, he uh, um, will meet and maybe we can continue the discussion. As you continue in London, we can do it in Nairobi. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, many blessings from all of us and keep praying for us as we continue looking forward to the end of this uh, scourge that is everywhere in the world. Uh, indeed, yes. Um, and then to uh, your, your church is uh, celebrating Christmas in uh, January, no? <laughs> That's the, uh, or is it the following the... No, no we, we follow the new calendar. It's the, we follow the new it's calendar, the, so it's 25th of December. It's actually, the, it's the, yes. So it's the, yes. Okay, so in this case... At, uh, at the same time with us in Greece, Father Thiani. I happen to be in Greece exactly. now. And we'll be celebrating oh. together. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Lovely. Well, so, have a blessed, blessed time. Yes, thank you very thank you much. Very and thank you to all of you. And, and then also a word to uh, all of you who are listening to this uh, on the... Um, uh, uh, on the recorded version, uh, the YouTube uh, uh, channel and the, uh, the, the Zoom link, um, you can write in, you can send messages and um, uh, if they don't mm -hmm. go through to our speakers, then I, I can pass them on. So um, this is also meant to be a, um, yes, well, it's become a piece of history now that it's recorded. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> true, yes. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much and uh, thank you for joining. Thank bye you bye. so much. Bye. All bye the bye. best. Bye. Stay well, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. <laughs>